Good evening. My guest tonight is the controversial actress Amanda Dunabit. She rose to fame in a cast in which she played a young woman without any clothes, marooned on a desert island with only Oliver Reed and 72 crates of scotch for company. <laughs> Now, Amanda, you're famous for that scene in the film in which you spurn Ollie's advances, thus causing him to go off in a drunken rage and get engaged to the Scotch. But I understand this isn't your favourite scene from your films. Oh, no, no, no. My favourite is the one where I emerge totally nude from a lake at the beginning of Kenny Russell's unconventional film biography of Tolstoy. Oh, yes, and you, of course, played... Tolstoy. <laughs> I told you it was unconventional. Yes. Hmm. I'm also extremely proud of my work with Disney, Bambi in the Buff, and the Naked Jungle book. <laughs> now, you're in this country to promote your latest film, which I believe also includes several scenes of graphic full frontal nudity. Does it? Oh, yes. <laughs> But naturally, I thought long and hard before accepting the role. But what finally convinced me to accept it was the fact that the nudity was in no way gratuitous and was completely essential to the plot. Yes, it is in fact a new production of St. Joan. That's right. The first all-nude version of St. Joan in movie history. I'm sure it is, but um, hasn't Moaning Joni and the Naughty Nymphos run into a bit of a problem with the senses? Well, yes, because... Basically, they don't understand the point of the acid house orgy. <laughs> Our version has more of a contemporary feel than the traditional interpretation. What, you mean modern dress? Yes, but uh, I take it off in the first ten minutes. <laughs> you see, I play Joan as a nudist. Um, in our version, she's a, a streetwise call girl who's trying to help her brother, a sadistic and caring detective, Dick Dark, <laughs> unravel a chain of brutal serial killings in downtown Reims. But apart from that, we stay totally faithful to Shaw's version. In what way? We've kept the original punctuation. What do you say to your critics who allege that your acting range is somewhat limited? Limited. Yes, I mean, have you actually ever appeared in a film where you haven't taken your clothes off? <laughs> I mean, your career to date seems to consist of roles such as Fourth Tart on the Left in Beverly Hills Cop 12, Tart with a Heart in Pretty Woman, Tart without a Heart in the Christian Bernard story. <laughs> I don't really think that most women's roles in movies tend to marginalise their position in society, portraying them as little more than inarticulate stereotypes. I wouldn't say that. Why not? It's got too many big words in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I really wouldn't have done it if I thought it was any way demeaning. In the same way that I wouldn't have posed for those shots for Playboy. You posed for Playboy? For a series of extremely tasteful semi-nude tableau. They're artistic. I mean, they're in black and white and they were shot by one of the world's most respected photographers of beautiful women. Oh, you mean Bailey or Litchfield? No. Harry the Horn Henderson. <laughs> Actually, they were his last shots before he was tragically taken from us. You mean he died? No, the vice squad caught up with him. <laughs> they were beautiful and artistic, and I'm not ashamed of them. And neither is my mother. And if you don't believe me, you can ask her. As soon as she comes out of that coma she's in. Thank you. And there I'm afraid we must leave it. But uh, join us next week when my guest will be another performer who'll be telling us what it's like to be described as nothing more than an inarticulate bimbo with a big chest and a brain the size of a peanut when I interview Sylvester Stallone. Good night. <laughs> And the chicken was remanded in custody pending a psychiatrist's report. <laughs> well, that's about it from the newsroom for now. We'll be back later with the 9 o'clock news. So until then, good night. <laughs>
Mind you, it's hell of a rush to get home before me husband comes in from work. <laughs> She's looking at the pictures. Oh, right, man. Like, yeah, when you age gypsies, like, my name's Starwalker. And we're just sort of like on the road, you know. We've got this bus, right? But we ain't like got no lights or MOT or insurance or nothing like that, right? Cos we're not, like, from this planet, you know? <laughs> we're just sort of, like, visiting. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, man, the police keep stopping us, right? And we tell them about our other planet, but they just sort of, like, stare at us. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they don't stop us no more. Well, they can't. Not since Big Di took the wheels off and sold them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, man? <laughs> oh, it's me. <laughs> I surprise myself sometimes. I thought I was back in the convent for a minute there. <laughs> Don't tell the others, right? Yeah. My boyfriend, man, Nick Picker. <laughs> He's gone green, man. Well, he didn't used to be, but, like, a couple of days ago, he picked the wrong mushrooms. <laughs> 400,000 of them. Man, did he fly. <laughs> Trouble is, he landed on an infant school playground from 300 feet up. <laughs> so I'm going out with pitch off now. Oh, like, Pitchoff is really brilliant, you know. He's a painter, a writer, a musician. You know, he's going to be so famous one day. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got the ump right now cos his gyro ain't come through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guess what, right? Guess what he said to me? He said, I ain't going to get out of my mind no more. I'm gonna get out of yours. <laughs> like, brilliant, you know. When I first met him, the thing that attracted me most was his Spanish blood. Like, I don't know where he gets it from, but he's got, like, buckets of it under his bed. <laughs> like, really mysterious and exotic. Oh, I tell you what, right, Glastonbury Festival, man, was brilliant, you know? I've, I've never seen nothing like it, like the music and the sunshine <laughs> and the smiles and the rainbows. I only found out yesterday I was unconscious for the whole thing. <laughs> Still. Pitchoff calls it designer realism, like, really mysterious. Oh, man, like, I've got to tell you, we had a bit of trouble yesterday. Rover got loose and started worrying sheep. In the end, we had to set his dog after him to drag him <laughs> off. Well, like, you know, he's been shot twice by farmers for doing that sort of thing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? One day, right, they're going to make a mistake and shoot the dog. <laughs> and then we'll all be in trouble, right, cos we all rely a lot on the money it claims off the Enterprise Allowance Scheme for making jewellery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I've got to tell you, like, this is, like, really horrible and really shocking. I just remembered. <laughs> I'm an undercover policewoman. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald, stop trying to put me down in front of our friends. But... <laughs> I don't mind giving Joan Collins a reading, but I wish she wouldn't leave her earrings. <laughs> Then yes. May I just have a few moments of your time? Sorry, Thank I'm you desperately late for work. Well, <laughs> Living here, 
All right. Uh, do come through. Look, look, you're really wasting your time. I do not talk to people with clipboards. Oh. The last one I spoke to sold me a Swiss timeshare property for £4,000. You know what? What? I am now the proud owner of a 19% share of a cuckoo clock. <laughs> you know what that makes me? Really gullible. Really angry. Oh. Especially at people with clipboards. So whatever it is you're selling, I don't want I'm not. Sex. What? I'm not selling. I'm doing a survey. A oh, survey? Yes, have a seat. Oh, thank you. Do. Uh, it's just a few easy-to-answer general questions about yourself and your family, all right? Yes, all right. Get on with it. Right. How many times a week would you say you achieve orgasm? Oh, I should say, I believe I... What kind of survey is this? Oh, that's not in the survey. I was just curious. <laughs> no, first question is to determine your social grouping. Oh. What publications do you read? Oh, the Daily Express, the Sunday Express, Sunday Times, the Spectator. I'll just write fascist down. <laughs> well, just trying to determine your social grouping, you see. Oh. We're particularly anxious to reach the AAs. Yes, well, I'm with the RAC. <laughs> Actually, it's the top socio-economic grouping. Oh. Hmm. Mind you, we are keen to meet ABs, BBs, CCs, DDs, down as far as GGs. Or as we call them, horses. So am I an AA or an AB? Well, do you have a CD? Um... Because ABs tend to have CDs. They listen on FM to the BBC, they've high IQs, know their MPs drive two CVs and have downstairs WCs. I see. Whereas CDs can't afford CDs. They buy LPs. They watch ITV, eat M&Ms, park their VWs in the NCP while they shop at the MFI in the local B&Q. Oh. And their favourite food is... Is a BLT. Shepherd's pie, actually. <laughs> yes, well, I drive a BMW, I listen to LBC, and I have to see the MDPDQ, so oh, if you don't mind. Uh, 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 sir, uh, hmm? last election, which party got your ex? As a matter of fact, it was the SLD. Ah, just as I thought. Ah, so what does that make me, an AA or an AB? Neither. You're a BF. Ah. <laughs> This show needs is a darling I'm home sketch. What a day I've had. You wouldn't believe. First of all, the computer breaks down and we all had to think. Then Bob from Accounts come in and says that... <laughs> What's the meaning of this, Fiona? The meaning of what, darling? <laughs> Don't come the innocent with me. I've warned you before about putting your things in my half of the wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lisa Maxwell. Good evening. Uh, can I have a question, please? Yes, well, where are all the famous people? I oh, thank your pardon. Well, where, where are all the famous people? Where's the big celebrity audience? I mean, I only came here to meet Michael Caine and Nigel Havers. Oh, don't have a me. It's not my fault. Blame the BBC. This show don't have a budget. It has a whip round. <laughs> Mark. Mark! Yep. Mark, <coughs> this right is supposed to be an audience full of celebrities. Yeah, so? Well, so far, all we've got is one. No, no. And I'm not so sure about him. <laughs> that's, that's Tony Blackburn. I've, I've, seen, I've seen him on the radio. Have you? <laughs> Mark, Mark, would you help me out? I need some celebrities. Me? Yeah. Help you? Yeah. Celebrity? No problem. You don't no. mind? Not at all. Where do you want me to go? Outside. Sorry. Let's see if you can find any. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Little treasure. Thanks, love. Cheers. Go on, then. <laughs> right, then. Over here. Over here, please. Can I ask a question? Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
time on British network television. Michael Douglas stars in Richard Attenborough's stunning adaptation of the hit musical, A Chorus Line. This is for chorus, it's not for you. But this is the only place there is for me. The agony and the ecstasy of making it big on Broadway. A Chorus Line, Saturday, ten past eight on one. One! Well, you can keep up with the latest news from the holiday scene on BBC Two now in the travel show, including reports from St Andrews in Scotland and the Costa del Sol. In half an hour here on BBC One, Phyllis Logan stars in Play on One, a moving and often droll account of life for four women in a Glasgow cancer ward, and the cow jumped over the moon. That's after the main evening news at nine o'clock now with Michael Burke. Unemployment sharply up again. Last month's figures show the biggest July increase since the 1930s. And three British divers are trapped on the bottom of the South China Sea with two hours oxygen left. Good evening. 126,000 people lost their jobs and started claiming benefit last month, more than the government expected, and the 16th month in a row in which unemployment has gone up. It was the sharpest July increase for more than 50 years. Seasonally adjusted, the underlying figure for July was up 67,800 to a total of just over 2,368,000. Jaguar Cars announced plans to shed 300 more jobs on the day the government revealed the biggest July increase of unemployment on record. Today's cuts come on top of the 1,500 jobs already shed by the luxury car maker since January. But the government has staked its reputation on the recession ending in the second half of this year and again insisted that things are getting better. This month's figures and uh, the last two months are all well below each of the previous three months. Uh, and I think that does indicate that the worst is over. Since reaching a low point in 1990, unemployment has now been rising for 16 consecutive months, adding three quarters of a million people to the unemployment register. And it will keep on rising towards three million by the end of next year. There was better news today on average earnings, which peaked at more than 10% in July 1990 and remained stubbornly high until the start of this year. Now there have been five consecutive monthly declines, Good news for the competitiveness of British industry, but not good enough to diffuse opposition anger. The government, as these figures show, have consistently misjudged the depth, the extent, the nature of this recession. And without urgent government action now, we will carry on in Britain, not just having the fastest rising unemployment in Europe, but the fastest rising unemployment of any main country in the Western world. I think the fundamental conclusion is that there is no sign of an end to the recession. The government are willing everybody to believe that the recession is on its way out. This is not a sign that that's true. The biggest increase in unemployment has again come in the southeast, where 26,000 people lost their jobs. Unemployment rose by 6,000 in the southwest, 3,000 in the north, and only 700 in Northern Ireland. But it still leaves the lowest percentage of the workforce looking for a job in the south, with a rate of 7% against 105 in the north and almost 14% in Northern Ireland. The engineering union reported today that 120,000 of its members had lost jobs this year and said the recession has inflicted irreparable damage on Britain's manufacturing base. 
It's got to the point now where the recession is indiscriminate. It's attacking, as I've said, public, private, white collar, blue collar, high tech, low tech. It, it is just raging on and the Chancellor really has uh, got to start to understand what industry needs. German central bankers raised their interest rates this afternoon. The increase was less than expected in the currency dealing rooms of London, but it could still limit the ability of the British government to respond to calls for cheaper credit here. The Bank of England, in its quarterly survey published today, could hardly have offered fainter support to the government's prediction of a recovery by Christmas. It says the economy is probably bumping along the bottom, but reports there's no clear evidence of an end to the recession. Latest figures on retail sales and manufacturing output have at last given the government some hard evidence to back its claim that the downturn is coming to an end. But not all the economic indicators are yet pointing the same way, and it remains clear that unemployment, which measures the human cost of recession, will keep on rising at least for another year. The number of homes being repossessed because people can no longer afford their mortgage payments has reached its highest ever level. The Council of Mortgage Lenders says there were more than 36,000 repossessions in the first half of this year, more than double the figure for the same period last year. Building societies believe it's the sharp rise in unemployment that's keeping repossessions at record levels, despite successive interest rate cuts that have saved the average mortgage holder £60 a month. There are fewer new arrears cases, which is the one bright light we can see, but there are so many cases in the pipeline that I'm afraid the figures could get worse before they get better. We'd certainly expect to see the possession figures higher in the second half of the year. This family from Halifax were threatened with repossession last November, but thanks to a mortgage rescue scheme, they're still living in the same house. It was bought by a housing association who then rented it back to them. Monthly mortgage payments of £250 were turned into a rent with housing benefit of just £40 a month. The family still own a quarter share of the house and can buy back more if they want to. We know our difference. We can manage, you know, to pay other people that we didn't manage to pay before. We can just about pay everything now. It's worked out real. The Housing Association will only help families refer to them by the local council, those that would otherwise end up homeless. They say mortgage rescue makes sense for families most at risk from repossession. For people whose job security or family relationships break down, then it's unavoidable and they suffer, their families suffer. It, it's a good thing to be able to keep people in the house that they were living in. It's cheaper and it's a very much more sensible way of going about it. So far, the government's resisted pressure to fund more schemes. It says that £400 million of income support already goes each year on paying mortgage interest for the unemployed. Three British divers and a New Zealander are trapped in a decompression chamber under the South China Sea tonight. It's thought they have only two hours of oxygen left. They were lost when the barge from which they were operating foundered in a typhoon. The barge was carrying nearly 200 people when it sank 65 miles off the coast of Hong Kong. Twelve people are known to have died and another 20, including the divers, are still missing. Throughout the day, rescue boats have been leaving Hong Kong Harbour to take part in the search for survivors. But conditions are still bad following the typhoon. Royal Navy teams have been ferried to the scene of the capsize, but they were having little luck locating the wreck, which has sunk to the seabed, taking with it the four trapped divers. They're in a decompression chamber which is bolted to the deck of the barge. Normally they can spend days at a time in it if the oxygen's maintained. Adjacent is a diving bell, but that cannot be winched to the surface. Now the diver's oxygen supply is running out. Many of those rescued earlier had spent hours in freezing water by the time they were pulled out of the sea. They were suffering from exposure and shock. Helicopter crews said they'd picked up survivors who'd been swept out as far away as five miles from where the barge sank. They'd stayed alive by hanging on to pieces of debris. One man told of being repeatedly dragged under the water by massive waves. They were taken to hospitals in Hong Kong, where many were treated for injuries sustained in the capsize, as well as hypothermia. When we see that the barge is, is uh, about 20 degrees sinking, everybody's scared already. So the safety man says, you go on that side. So we go on that side, and then the boat comes sink, so he said, come on, jump, jump. When I jumped, so the bus is going down. And then 
I think I'm going to die, you see. But I'm very lucky. As the emergency services brought more survivors to hospital, the RC rescue operation was continuing offshore as oxygen and time was running out for the trapped divers. The UN Secretary General, Mr. Perez de Quelliar, left Geneva tonight saying a deal to release the hostages in Lebanon could take days or weeks. It depended on how quickly both sides reacted. Iran is urging Britain to put pressure on Israel, but Israel insists it won't release Arab prisoners until it receives clear information on seven servicemen missing in Lebanon, as Jeremy Bowen reports from Jerusalem. Good morning, sir. Mr. Prime Minister. In Jerusalem, Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir dismissed a suggestion that the Israeli deputation was coming home empty-handed. Well, we're in the middle of a negotiation. It could be a long process, maybe.